Okay. Um, well, it looks like it's 3 p.m. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you here. Um, my name is Kayla Ripple, and I'm a senior associate with the LenFest Ocean Program. So for those of you who may not know us, and those of you who do, um, rather than listening to me ramble on about our work, we actually have a new short video that may help to give you a better idea of what we do and the kind of research we fund. Um, so let me go ahead and share that with you now. One second. We used to think about the oceans as boundless, capable of producing limitless amounts of food and resources. But today we understand that that's not the case. All species in the ocean are interconnected. What we do to one species impacts other areas. The Linfest Ocean Program is a science grant-making program based at the Pew Charitable Trusts. Its mission is to work alongside scientists and managers to identify the most pressing questions facing the coastal and marine environment and to fund scientific research projects to fill those information gaps. We tackle fisheries issues around the world on how to create sustainable catches. We are looking at how climate is impacting species movements in the United States and also around the world and what impact that might have on coastal communities. Sharing research results and engaging with stakeholders is what sets the Lenfest Ocean Program apart. Together, that group of individuals can bring their expertise to best answer the questions facing the marine environment. The Lenfest Ocean Program will continue to build upon these collaborations and support useful and usable science that leads to evidence-based decision-making to support healthy oceans, the planet, and our future. Um, cool. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you would like to learn more about LenFest, you can visit us at our website at lenfestocean.org. And while you're there, you can sign up uh, for our monthly newsletter. Also, if you're on Twitter, you can follow us at LenFest Ocean. In fact, we'll be live tweeting this webinar today, so feel free to follow along or engage with us there using the hashtag LOPWebinar. Today, we're excited to have joining us Dr. Steve Cadron from the University of Massachusetts and Dr. Jason Link with NOAA Fisheries. They're here to introduce their new research project to investigate the use of portfolio theory in fisheries management. And my colleague, Emily Knight, is gonna be dropping links in the chat box and she'll uh, drop a link to the project fact sheet in there as well, um, if you'd like to keep that for a little light reading later. Um, but I'm going to leave it to the researchers to explain what portfolio theory is and the details surrounding their project. Um, but for us at LenFest, we're keen to understand, much like many of you here, how best to facilitate ecosystem-based fisheries management, or EBFM. So we hope the results of this project will illuminate another tool that managers can use to do this. Um, another note on this webinar, this is what we like to call a launch webinar where researchers are sharing details at the start of their project rather than only sharing results at the end. Um, the aim is to increase stakeholder engagement and dialogue throughout the life of the project. So if you'd like to, we encourage you to reach out to members of the research team and us at LenFest if you have questions or want to engage with us further after the webinar. As this project goes on, we'll continue to share information on its progress via a variety of avenues like on our website at lenfestocean.org, in our newsletter, on Twitter and Facebook, and other places as they pop up and seem appropriate. But for now, I've started creating a running distribution list for everyone who's interested. Um, if you're not on that list or unsure if you are, just send me a note to include, to include you and I'll be sure to add you to that list. Um, I will also put my uh, contact information in the chat box as well. Um, and lastly, before I hand it over to Steve to get us started, I just want to share a few webinar logistics with everyone. Um, with so many people on the line, 
all attendees are muted upon entry. This helps to prevent any feedback or echoes during the webinar, um, but we do wanna hear from you and we're saving time at the end for question and answer. So please use the Q&A panel to type and submit your question at any point during the webinar. If you have a comment or something other than a question, you can type that into the chat box. I'll be keeping track of these and I'll read them aloud at the end for the researchers to answer. We hope to get to all of the questions, but if not, folks are certainly welcome to follow up with us here at LENFEST or with the research team. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. We'll make it publicly available once it's ready, and I'll distribute the recording link to the distribution list once we have it. So feel free to share that with others who may be interested or who weren't able to make it today. And with that, I think I've covered everything. So we'll go ahead and get started and I'll turn things over to Dr. Kadrin. Um, Steve, you should have the ability to share your screen. Yep. Looks good. Great, if you could just confirm that you can see that and yes. I'll initially just hand it over to Jason. Go ahead, Jason. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Kayla. We're gonna to talk to you all about this topic. Go ahead to write to the next slide, if you would, Steve. Um, wanna give you all an introduction to our outline. Kayla just did the introduction. We're gonna give you a little bit of portfolio theory and why we would use it in fisheries management. Steve's gonna talk about the research approach and then I'll bring it back to the management aspect and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. Uh, again, wanna thank everybody for attending. Hope you all are having a good afternoon or good morning or even good evening if you watch this at another time or you're on another time. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's jump into the next slide. So fisheries management has been based largely on single species. That's classical, that's historical. And you see our blue infographic, we often use the single species fisheries management at the bottom, focuses on just the individual stocks. And it really has historically had limited or no consideration of the entire fishery system. And that's changing. And we all know that that needs to change. And largely that's because this approach has resulted in many positive outcomes, certainly, but it also can be risky. And by risky, we mean it can be uncertain in some of our understanding of the drivers of individual populations. Uh, certainly there are multi-species interactions that we need to account for. Certainly uh, it's risky in that we have limited ability to predict some future environmental conditions, even at, at small scales. So the risks, certainly to the population are, are well known, well documented, but the risks extend to the economic, social, and even governance considerations. So long story short, a lot of folks, a lot of you all listening in on this call, uh, this webinar, have really pushed for a move towards EBFM. Go ahead to the next slide, if you would. And, and that's really where we acknowledge that fisheries managers are tasked with making these decisions harvest race, biomass targets, spatial distributions, et cetera, et cetera. But it has been somewhat uncoordinated among different fish species and, and even fisheries within an ecosystem. Not entirely, we get that, but in large part, that single species approach has missed that. And because of that, these more classical approaches can yield, shall we say, some suboptimal outcomes, particularly as the environment continues to change. And the other thing we notice is that single species approaches can result in foregone yield. We may actually be leaving uh, dollar bills in the ocean, as it were. So with those considerations and to meet all the legal mandates for managing fisheries, what we've noticed is that an ecosystem approach is not only allowable, but it's advisable. And one of the challenges we've had then is, okay, we all kind of get that we're moving forward with that, but golly, you know, how do we do this? What's the operational stuff look like? And that's kind of what we're, we're gonna look at and explore with this project. And we'll talk to you a little bit more about that today. So this is a slide, I think uh, Tony uh, Marshak and I did this. We basically show here that average annual primary production in any given large marine ecosystem uh, impacts the fisheries revenue and certainly 
Tony stepped us through from annual primary productivity to fish, to fish landings, to landings, then to revenue. And he walked through all that. I forget where it was, science or nature or whatever. And the point is that any given ecosystem, there's only so much biomass available and there's only so much fish that we're going to produce in any given ecosystem, largely because of the primary production constraints that you see on the bottom. You know, Charlie Stock, I think, is on, on this or is listening, and Kevin Friedland and others have kind of shown all the different pathways of that beautiful, wonderful research. And, and what we get is that inherent properties of the ecosystem, that that basic level, basal level of the food web, the food pyramid that you see here, really constrains how much fish and then therefore how many dollars or what the revenue can be in any given location. And that's really important because the productivity in the ocean is changing. We need to track that. Um, and we need to translate this into economics. And that's pretty critical as well. And given those constraints, we're realizing that we can't scale this at the scales we're talking about to add more materials to create more fish. It's just an ecological law, law of thermodynamics, mass and conservation thereof. And, and this isn't like farming or forestry at th those scales where you can add nutrients. So what this ultimately means is there's limits to production in an ecosystem. And go ahead and hit the next button. What that results in is a cage match. So I'm gonna date myself here, but you can have Hulk Hogan on one side going after you know, the Rowdy Roddy Piper, whoever your favorite wrestler is. And there's only so much available. So what is it? Are we gonna have this species or that species? And then it's just this cage match and that you can have protected species and targeted species or two targeted species or a targeted species that is at one trophic level that eats another target species at another. There's all kinds of permutations to the cage match. And what a lot of us have kind of come up with is, well, shucks, let's step back and look at this. And is there a better way to explore all of these systematically to get out of the cage match, to acknowledge that there's a limit to the production, and then maybe look at ways that we can perhaps optimize or maximize or somehow look at ways we can manage towards a better system that maximizes this fishery's revenue given those constraints. So, and this is where we play the organ music and you're queued up and what this sets up for is the next slide is Shazam, portfolio management. And, and that's what we're, we're trying to do is with multiple stocks, just like a financial stock portfolio, what we've seen time and again, there's lots of studies out there that emergent properties of a diverse portfolio and their management units are more stable than any one of the given units on its own. A lot of these approaches, a lot of this theory have been explored for marine fisheries to mitigate risks, to explore this loss in revenue we alluded to, um, to explore, you know, efficiency, market shifts, catchability, even climate change. Uh, but what we're proposing is this approach is a much more systematic treatment of all stocks or fisheries in an ecosystem, focusing on aggregate group dynamics or a group of management units, you know, many species or populations. And really the challenge has been, this is all theoretical, but how do we actually look at this and, and what does that look like in practice? So if we go to the next slide, what we see is that the theory, and this again is from, from Jen et al and, and Garrett and others have been involved with this. There's several bits of work on this fabulous stuff. And really the further away you are from the efficiency frontier. So that solid curve there that's labeled F is the front frontier and where you might be say at point b is you know any given portfolio of fisheries in any given point in time or place and the further away you are from that frontier the more risk you have and perhaps less economic yield you obtain and this this has been well shown well demonstrated 
Uh, some nascent studies empirically have, have begun to show this. Theoretically, it makes sense. And the other thing is the second curve, F prime there, the dotted curve actually shows that the efficiency frontier of an aggregate or an ecosystem kind of uh, frontier outperforms the single species approaches or the, the F curve there. So really, where are we to the right of these curves? And is there a way we can maybe get closer to them? And by closer to them, what we're saying is let's have a little less risk and maybe let's increase our expected return. So that's the theory. Again, uh, let me go to the next slide, but that was really, really quick. And the reality is we've begun to look at this with some very common and standard data sets. And just for the South Atlantic region, uh, Howard Townsend has pulled together some information and those preliminary results demonstrate you know, the, the relative benefits of this. And it helps again, potentially to get us towards EBFM. And you see the, the time periods are kind of average values at different places in, or sorry, different periods of time. And then that risk is way higher than perhaps it could be. And the yield or the expected value is a lot lower than perhaps what it could be. And again, the single species curve is to the right and less efficient than the, the frontier curve uh, for EBFM. So we're beginning to see this empirically and look at that. So what does all of this mean? If we could go to the next slide, what that's saying is that there's a lot of evidence for the value of portfolio approaches, but there's very few examples of its application in actual operational practice and even if not practice, consideration. And this project will develop worked examples of these portfolios for selected regions that will then be part of a formal set of discussions in several of our regional uh, organizations. And, and again, the, the idea here, and we'll get to this at the end, is just, just pilot these and see if it uh, could make a difference or might help improve things. So if we could go to the next slide, let me call out our steering committee. A lot of you are asking, why is a, an ecosystem guy and a stock assessment guy doing economics? At least I would be asking that. Well, we've had several discussions on that and it, it came up and long story short, we have wonderful, excellent economists on our steering committee. My counterpart at NOAA Fisheries, uh, the other ST for economics is Doug Lipton. He's helping guide us. John Walden at the Northeast Center, Garrett DePiper, Rob Griffin, all really fabulous economists who have worked in this space before are guiding us and giving us reality check on the economics. Karen Abrams is with our Office of Sustainable Fisheries and she's giving us the reality check on the regulatory and governance considerations. Howard Townsend is on our steering committee. He also is, works at NOAA Fisheries but has kind of a modeling background. So he's helping us look at the broader context. And Lisa Kerr at GMRI, also wonderful modeler in her own right, but serves on the New England SSC and Jeff Buckle, same criteria, same credentials, but he serves on the South Atlantic SSC. And those are important connections for us to, again, have a reality check of where we are. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Steve, see how we're doing on time and let him tell you a little bit more of what we might wanna be doing. Go ahead, Steve, thanks. Great, thanks, Jason. If you could just confirm you can hear me again. Yep. Great. And uh, you really set me up well for the next step. Um, we're thankful to have your guidance and the guidance from the steering committee uh, to start this work and also thankful to the LENFES funding. We're able to recruit uh, a really talented young group uh, to do the heavy lifting on this. Uh, Lauren Brewster uh, is a postdoc on the project. She'll be starting next month. She's coming from uh, Florida Atlantic University. Uh, Fiona Edwards is a master's student who's been um, investigating the skate fishery and other demersal fisheries in New England for her master's degree. And Max Greslick is a PhD student working on multi-species modeling. And so hopefully uh, these young scientists can learn from uh, you, Jason, and the steering committee and the larger group of you 
uh, in the regions where we'll be applying uh, this theory to practice. I think Jason described it, but our overall goal is to take uh, this por these portfolio evaluations from academic uh, toward demonstration to really try to test out some applications to US fisheries. And so what we'll be doing um, this spring and summer is compiling the data on multi-species fisheries to um, support those frontier analyses and then working with regional teams to modify those toward how they might be uh, implemented more in practice. Uh, the steps there are to compile the data. We're in the process of that now. Uh, synthesize the data to prepare it for the analyses. Uh, create the portfolios. There'll be some decisions there as far as the degree of aggregation uh, across species and spatially in fisheries. Uh, that we want to evaluate alternative portfolios for, uh, and then evaluate those risk gaps um, for single species versus portfolio and several different alternatives of portfolios, and hopefully provide examples to management uh, so that we can really start uh, considering implementing in each of the case study regions. Um, so Fiona and, and Max have been going through the literature, a lot of the literature that Jason just described to see what tools we can use um, for these applications, uh, compiling the data, then developing the models. Um, these uh, frontier curves that um, Jason showed uh, in theory and Howard Townsend had applied them in more practice uh, will be uh, really populating these with the data available. Uh, the main risks so far are revenue and variability in revenue uh, for risks, but we really want to expand that risk analysis to some of the other common risks that we confront, like the probability of overfishing, um, market shifts, climate change. Um, and so hopefully we can expand on the frontier analyses with the broader risks. The data we'll be using is explicitly uh, open, publicly available. We'll be using the NOAA Fisheries Landings Database. Uh, the website's there, I can paste it in the chat later. Uh, but this is fairly aggregated data rather than the real granular data of trip-based or haul-based. Uh, but th these are the data we want to use initially uh, just so that data availability is not a constraint, is that at least at these initial demonstrations, uh, we're using data that any of you can get from this system. Uh, so we have broad coverage across uh, all species fishery sectors um, so that we can provide the information for the analyses. As we get further on into some of these other risks, we're probably going to have to supplement this with um, single stock biomass landings, perhaps landings by area, uh, environmental climate indicators. Uh, but for now, we're really starting with this publicly available data. And if you haven't used this uh, NOAA landings data set, uh, it's fairly simple in this demonstration. I'm just going to select commercial fisheries from 2020 in New England. And for now, I'm just choosing all species. And this is the output I can get and I can download this and I can change for different years, different regions and different target species. So where are we gonna start? Um, we're gonna start with some examples. Uh, so we got some feedback from our steering committee um, and our uh, understanding and familiarity as well. Uh, and two fisheries that really seem to be begging for this type of analysis are uh, New England multi-species and South Atlantic multi-species. Uh, in New England, we have we already have some portfolios like our skate complex. Uh, we already have multi-species plans like our groundfish plan. Uh, in the Southeast, there's the snapper grouper complex that has dozens of species in it. Um, and so these are selected uh, based on some of the multi-species constraints, uh, primarily technical interactions, choke species, um, so we feel that there's a need there. Uh, the data is available to us. Um, and there's also been a lot of ground broken by the councils there. Uh, each of them has uh, ecosystem habitat 
committees that have considered um, and really softened the ground for us to, to try to implement these there. Um, and so we hope that these two uh, example systems can um, meet that objective of demonstrating um, the performance of portfolio management. Uh, with each of them, we're going to have to make some decisions. Uh, we're gonna work with our steering committee and a broader outreach uh, to the communities in New England and the South Atlantic uh, to get feedback on how best to implement this. Um, this is going to be somewhat adaptive. Uh, we'll engage with the people. Uh, and this degree of aggregation, uh, I think is gonna be one of our primary decisions in this. If we look at the New England species, we already have the Northeast complex with 20 stocks, uh, but those trawl, gillnet, longline fisheries are also catching monkfish, they're catching skates and spiny dogfish. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of enthusiasm in New England for having a more coordinated approach to these demersal fisheries. Uh, but there's also technical interactions with some of the invertebrate fisheries uh, like sea scallops. So, the, the degree of aggregation goes from the extremes of single species, the current practice, to uh, the entire group of New England managed species, to probably some intermediates where there are more technical interactions and, and there may be a better buy-in at those intermediate levels. If we go to the South Atlantic, as I said, there's dozens of snapper groupers. Um, so that's a, a really good candidate there, uh, but those could be also expanded to all of the fisheries in the South Atlantic in different degrees of aggregation. If we demonstrate this, um, I think all of the tools that we'll develop, both the, the data tools and the modeling tools, they should be fairly easy to apply those to other regions. That's gonna be one of our touchstones here is to try to keep this uh, to a way that's not too finely tailored that what we learn in these New England and South Atlantic demonstrations cannot be directly applied. We really want some tools that can be directly applied to all of the US uh, regions and beyond. Um, of course, part of the reason that there's variability that some stocks are going up and some stocks are going down uh, is because of climate. Some uh, that's affecting different stocks differently, whether it's their spatial distribution or their productivity. And so, really considering climate in this, uh, we think will be one of the features of portfolio management that is worth considering. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Jason to, to tell us how we can bring this to management. It's all yours, Jason. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate you walking through the, the plans that we have and introducing our team. The sense here is how does this work become relevant. And the, the top panel is a cartoon example of what we would call stock overfishing, where you have a suite of different species on the left, and then perhaps one of them is overfished. And that's, a, you know, again, a cartoon pictographical representation of what that might look like. What we're seeing in some places, and certainly other parts of the world, more so in the U.S., but is you actually have ecosystem overfishing. And, and this is driving us to think that we probably need to think about these as portfolios and capture the full range of that complex or suite of, of species that we're talking about, largely in the sense that we don't want to get there, but the portfolio approach might allow us to mitigate both of those. So what we're looking to do is to connect with a diverse array of stakeholders, and Steve mentioned them. Um, I just want to reiterate that we're engaging with the steering committee and have plans to do that routinely and share our results, not only at the end of the project, like Kayla mentioned, but as we go along and, and have input and so forth there. Uh, so really, we're looking for feedback from you all via this, this launch seminar and via you all. I mean, everyone listening and who might watch this later, please give us ideas, context, feedback. The other thing is we want to communicate some of the challenges that or hear from you what those challenges might be in this larger management context and how this method may be of use or it may not be. The, the last thing we want to do is to show up to 
any organization and and say this is the way it's going to be this is you know you have to do this we just simply want to explore the approach and put it on the table for discussion if we can do that we'll be very successful in our own eyes and i think if we can engage folks to help us tackle and present perhaps options of how we might as steve said aggregate or how we might look at certain covariates then we'll even be better at that so that's what we're asking for as well is just how can we communicate with everybody to get those and we want to make sure that we're we're informing and helping fisheries management in general not you know again just another research project for its own sake and we we also want to share how this project is building on the foundation that's already been laid by several folks, several of whom are on this call, but, but more than that, perhaps setting up future research by many of you listening in, and certainly with our team or other teams, we wanna see, are there things we can do? We might not be able to answer every question, but that's what we're aiming to do, to bring it back to management so that this is again, useful and has utility in a decision-making context. So if we could go to the next slide, I believe this is the animation one. Um, so there's value. You've seen this before. And the dashed line here might be the single species portfolio. And then the, the solid line is the more aggregate or ecosystem portfolio frontier. And where we are in, in the current position might be where this orange or red dot or whatever color it is on your screen might be and the, the gap between that and the frontier is the risk gap and how do we close that what does that look like what configurations of species within the portfolio might that be how do we minimize risk and here by risk we're talking beyond the usual acls and ofls and so forth but really the variance associated with that value of whatever fishery or set of fisheries we're talking about so Steve, I think the first, uh, yeah, if we were to do something like this and keep going, Steve, I, I think uh, we're, we're going until we get to the top and we have some texts that say, you know, maybe we could reconfigure this a bit more and have the same risk, but more value. Maybe that's an option. Maybe that would be an outcome and that would be interesting. Or if you hit it again, maybe we go to the left and we keep, rejiggering the configuration of how we might do things and we get the same value but less risk. I think both of those would be interesting and perhaps valuable, useful to consider. But if you hit the next set of slides, Shazam, there it is. That's good punching, Steve. Thanks. That was fast. The the thing is um maybe we want less risk and more value. And there might be a space in this portfolio uh, efficiency frontier that would allow us to do that. And, and that really is the research part of this is exploring what those configurations might be to help us get maybe less risk and more value. So the last slide, I think, again, brings this back to management. Uh, we, we, again, can't reiterate enough. We wanna connect with a boatload of stakeholders, interested parties, so forth, and we want to distribute this information and, and get feedback. Um, what we see here, the two graphics show um, one system in Alaska, the Bering Sea, that's managed kind of for a portfolio with the, the 2 million metric ton ground fish cap. And then another region where it's still managed on a stock by stock basis. And you still have the total landings um, but the individual stocks in the one tend to be a little more stable. The other slides that go with this show more stable economics and less overfishing going on versus the other region that manages on a stock by stock basis where that's a little different. So are there challenges of how you might do this? What would that look like to go from one to the other or some intermediate step? And those challenges, can be there, and, but also challenges or opportunities. So maybe we can explore what those opportunities might be and explore you know, what are the challenges, but opportunities in terms of the technical value, the legal precedent and our understanding of national standards and 
you know, refining our even our understanding of value and risk. And, and we would particularly highlight risk perhaps in a, a broader way than, than we do now. Um, the last thing is, again, we wanna share how this is, is building for the future on the topic and, and think of this as foundational, something for the future, maybe functional, maybe has applications and utility in other regions as Steve mentioned. But we also want to make sure that we can do this with a range of testing and we, we may end up doing MSE testing on the approach in each region. region. Now, that's another step that we're, we're considering down the road. But the, the point is that this could be something that really might um, foundationally shift some of our thinking on the topic. And it may or it may not, but we really want to push those boundaries and explore the topic to see if that can actually be something that we can utilize. And again, the whole point of this is really, let's just do a pilot project for a couple of regions, have a discussion on those and see if we can move forward. So with that, I think we're gonna wrap it up, hand it back to Kayla and then tackle any questions you all might have. So thank you all for your attention. Awesome. Thank you, Steve and Jason. That was a really fantastic presentation, um, walking us through, you know, what your expectations are, your research objectives. Really, really appreciate you putting this together for us. Um, we actually received quite a few questions during the presentation. So I'm actually going to start sort of towards the top of those questions and kind of go down the list from there. Um, but the first question asks, whether you're aware um, if multi-species portfolio management is being used on non-fishery groups. Uh, so for example, things like crops, vegetative cover, et cetera. So I would call on the grad students who've done the literature search. If, if they wanna chime in, they can um, unmute themselves or raise their hand or whatever. But I think the short answer to that is yes, we are aware of that the level and degree of which it's applied and how it's being utilized uh, varies, obviously. The distinction is a lot of those applications are agricultural and they have a very different ownership and governance context than they would in fisheries. But I would offer any, Max, Fiona, even Lauren to, to weigh in to augment that if they would like. Yeah, and I'll just point out, um for the grad students who are on the line. If you all raise your hand, uh, it'll show up in my project screen. Uh, so I can just click on you if you feel like, well, if you're on the line and feel like answering the question, um, but no pressure. Cool. Uh, so this question is asking about um, the language for processing the relevant literature, which actually might be a very good question for some of the grad students who are working on this. Um, is the research team using AI or natural language processing to compile and screen to compile and screen relevant literature? Max, that's all you. <laughs> um, I think someone was there. Hand up. If you can't, I, I will jump speak. in for yeah. Max. Oh, and I got him. Go ahead, Max. Found him. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thanks for that question. Thanks for the talk, uh, Jason and Steve. Um, I have not been using AI, uh, just kind of running through um, other resources that I know, but um, I would definitely encourage or uh, be welcome to any help, AI or otherwise. Um, so if anyone knows how to do that, then I'd be interested in learning as well. Great. Thanks, um, Max. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Um, are you using landing data from Canada as well? Do those Northeast demersal stocks cross the U.S. and Canada border? Steve, I think that'd be great for you. Yeah, uh, so the, the short answer is no. We'll be using just U.S. landings um, in, the, in the New England region. Um, there are some transboundary stocks on Georgia's bank, 
Um, and so that might be one of the more granular things to do as we get into particularly um, New England groundfish that there are in some stocks that are caught by both countries uh, that we might want to supplement the NOAA landings data with Canadian catch. So that, that's a great suggestion, thanks. Awesome, thank you. Um, and we actually received two questions on this one. Um, so just curious if you're planning on using state and recreational catch data in addition to federal catch data. Steve, you wanna handle that and basically say the same? Sure, um, so the, the database that I, I showed um, includes state reported catches uh, and recreational catches. So uh, we have um, the revenues won't be there for recreational, but when we look at the uh, landing utilities, we can get those there. Great. Um, in addition to employing fisheries biology and economic theory to study how portfolio theory might mitigate risk, I wonder how sustainability science might inform your work. Have you considered how human behavior, for example, different fishing um, meters employed by different fleet segments and vessel sizes, classes, skipper level preferences and traditions, et cetera, and also regulatory constraints might impact the feasibility and adoption of different portfolios? Good question. Steve, you want to tackle that one? Or would you like me to? Sure. I mean, I think my initial response was that the, that's kind of the more high resolution data that we'd want to get into, um, but certainly the effect of regulations. And I think here's where having our steering committee, having some uh, people who are engaged in the council SSC process, but also getting more involved with the council communities themselves. Um, they can minimally give us some interpretive context to um, why certain periods um, had certain performance uh, relative to others. And so interpreting the data that we'll get from the NOAA fisheries database. Uh, but then again, maybe what some of the product from these demonstrations are, or what the next steps would be, is to really pull this off for New England Demersal or for South Atlantic Snapper Grouper. These are the things that those publicly available data don't have that we would need to confront. So again, a great suggestion uh, that might be for the next generation of these after these demonstration projects. Sounds great. Uh, this person also mentions that there's lots of interesting recent work from people who are working on the US West Coast that you could use to draw upon something like this. Awesome. And speaking of, um, working with the regional councils for feedback. Uh, someone did ask if you'll be sharing your work with the regional councils. So maybe you can talk a little bit more about your expectations and thoughts around sharing with um, the fishery management councils. Yeah, so I, I'll jump in on this, Steve, if you want. The, the, the sense is we're going to do the work and then not just in an ivory tower, we're gonna to involve all the communities that we've discussed already. We have several steering committee members who are involved with councils on purpose. And certainly as this develops, we would have more. We're not planning to go to council meetings per se that are decisional. What our plan is, is to table this in a discussional or informational context at the council science and statistical committees. And I think that's probably the appropriate level given the nature of this kind of work and so forth. And then we will aim to get feedback and input and so forth at that level. And then from there, we'll iterate and then we'll see where it goes. Uh, and again, the, the measure of success for us is, are we able to have those discussions? Not, are we gonna get this you know, implemented three years from now or seven years from now, anything like that? We're, we're just trying to explore the topic. So that's the primary way that we would engage with the councils. And I would also add, it's largely the two councils here as the primary examples, but we're happy to go and have similar discussions with the commissions as appropriate for the state fishery commissions. So thank you for the question. 
Awesome. And maybe you could talk a little bit more about any initial reactions that you've heard from the New England Fisheries Management Council and the South Atlantic Council, if there are any. Steve, you want to handle New England? I can handle. Yeah, so uh, where this is a kickoff region, we really haven't engaged yet um, on our steering committee, um, certainly with Jeff and Lisa, and, you know, they're all in. They see the, um, the potential utility for this, uh, but also starting to, to send out some feelers to uh, the different plan development teams and committees within those councils uh, so that they're aware of what we're doing here. Um, start, you know, going to those meetings, start giving them progress reports and updates um, and getting their feedback on some of our decisions. Um, so unfortunately, the answer is not yet, but um, that's probably the next step after we have some demonstration products to show. Makes sense. Sounds good. Um, so this person is asking about incorporating the concept of shifting baselines into this approach. Do you think that's something appropriate or something that you could do with this um, research? So I'll, I'll jump in on this, Steve, if that's all right. So I, th I think there was another question on the temporal coverage of the data set, if I read it correctly. And what we're looking at is ostensibly data that goes back to the 1950s. So we, we probably would catch some kind of shift given the length of the time series, even short of that, you know, only using the last 40 years instead of the full time series, we might catch some, but probably the bigger thing, and, and again, I, I'd love to have a chat with whoever asked this question because I'm not sure I'm getting the full context, but the bigger thing is what has shifted in terms of the expectations for the management, what has shifted in terms of expectations for the legal requirements, and then what has shifted in the environment. And we can go back and look at those things. And we have, you know, committee members, steering committee members that, that have a lot of that context. But also, and I think probably more importantly, is looking at what the future might look like given different configurations and, and legal elements, but particularly climate change, which is another form of a shifted baseline, if, if you will. So the short answer is I think we do have the capacity to do this. What it actually looks like or what the, the question asker was getting at, you know, hopefully we've tackled that issue, but or, or at least started to, but I think we are by the nature of the data and the, the nature of the kind of analyses going to be considering that and including that. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so this person asks, the portfolio theory in finance compares the return and risk based on stock prices and comes up with an efficient frontier using riskless, riskless asset. But you're comparing fish value with its risk. Are they really comparable since the characteristics of financial and fish stocks are quite different? What is the riskless asset in fishery and what is the systemic risk in fishery? I think this is the one where we call on our economics colleagues on our steering committee. I don't know, John Walden, are you on? You wanna handle this or uh, Garrett, I don't know if you were able to stay on. I know you had to jump, but uh, if John, if you wanna handle that, uh, just trying to see who else is here. I don't know if Doug is. Otherwise, we can try to tackle it. Yeah, and again, if they just raise their hand. Oh, there we go. I see that John is raising their hand. So John, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, um, and uh, I'm not sure I can do it justice. So yeah. You're right. I mean, in the um, financial portfolio um, literature and the way things are done, you know, there's there's all sorts of risk metrics um, that that are developed, and you know, the riskless is assets like a U.S. Treasury bond, right? And so the the um, the stocks and the, the prices and the rate of return are generally um, compared to that riskless asset. And so the in the stock literature, there's been a ton of uh, metrics developed. One's called a beta, which basically shows 
how a particular stock or mutual fund or portfolio moves in comparison to the, the rest of the market. So if it moves greater than um, the market, it's considered more risky. So if the, you know, if it's more variable, it's considered more risky. So in terms of a fishery, what you probably want to do is pick a benchmark time period or perhaps bundle of, of species or, or fisheries as your base and then look at, in this particular instance, it's a mean variance trade-off, right? So you're trying to figure out how that, um, the particular fishery or group of species or other time period, how that mean variance is moving compared to what you've set as your benchmark. And there's various ways to do that. Um, and it, there's, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, portfolio theory and portfolios are widely used, um, not only, you know, in, in finance, uh, they're used to look at, you know, human development. Um, is the human development index that the United Nations uses is a portfolio based method. Um, they've been used to, to in, in Europe, they're used for regulatory purposes. So there's, there's just a lot of room to maneuver around this particular topic and a lot of ways to construct these various measures that I think will will give you uh, good answers as far as, as risk goes. So um, I hope I've answered that adequately, but I'll, I'll be glad to say more if needed. Thanks. Thanks, John. That was very helpful. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, John. Great. Um, so there's two questions about scale. Uh, the first one, what will be your temporal scale? Are you dealing with seasonality here? Steve, you want to handle that? Yeah, the database that we have so far are annual statistics. Um, so seasonality uh, won't be in this first pass, but uh, that may be something to keep our eyes open to is that there may be important seasonalities, especially with variability and revenue uh, to consider. So not in the first pass, but uh, maybe that's one thing that comes out of this is that uh, we'll certainly have the more detailed data available for some of the fisheries where we could try that. So thanks for that suggestion. Cool, thank you. Um, and then what do you envision as the minimum or most appropriate scale at which this method could be applied? You know, for example, basin, habitat, et cetera. Um, the regions seem like artificial constructs. So is there, you know, some other scale at which this could be applied? Yeah. Um, do you want me to handle that, Steve? Is that okay? Or, okay. So, sure. Um, thanks. The, the sense is this is a scaleless, sorry, this is scale independent analysis as long as the data are appropriate. But we go back to how the data were collected and reported largely they're on the US regions or large marine ecosystem or at least council regions in the US context. So given that first step, and that's kind of the first pilot and the intended audience, that's probably the scale we'll, we'll end up focusing on. But just as Steve said, we are open to broader con constructs, you know, certainly base and scale entire oceans as a possibility. Um, in terms of what's the minimum scale, you know, down to habitats or particular estuaries, theoretically, there's nothing stopping us from going to smaller scale. I think practically it's a matter of data density and the reporting that goes with that. So that's probably, you know, a dimension that will we'll probably fix, at least for the first pilot and pass through, but it's a dimension uh, just like the seasonality dimension we can explore later on. Right now we're primarily focusing on the taxonomic dimension and degrees of aggregation, if that makes sense. Thank you. Great. And someone else actually had a really similar question, um, but is also asking about, you know, what do you think would be an ideal spatial scale? Whatever is appropriate for the data and the management need. Perfect. Great. Um, okay, so I think we're getting to the end of our questions in the Q&A um, that aren't related to each other. But I also see some questions in the chat box. So I'm going to shift over 
there and ask you some questions from the chat box as well. Um, what is the expected robustness or flexibility of the portfolio approach to issues such as choke species, large changes in commercial value, and or changes in species classification? Yeah, I'll jump in on this one, Steve. Um, that was by Yvonne. Hi, Yvonne. Nice to see you virtually. Um, so I, I think this approach handles this. If you look at like your mutual funds for the stock market for your retirement account, it's designed to handle all those kinds of fluctuations and, and adjust to them. Um, the choke species issue, though, is probably different than your mutual fund for your retirement account. That is something that we're very aware of, and it's a potential constraint. That's part of the discussion and the debate and the analysis and all of the things we're going to look at and research here in the first phase. How, how does that limit or constrain that space relative to the frontier gap? So that's probably the, the biggest challenge. The other things that we have, um, sorry, I see your comment about cage match. You interrupted my answer, but thanks for that. <laughs> um, the other thing is, um, yeah, the, the element of what is managed, what isn't managed, all of that's open for discussion. And, and we're having a lot of those discussions actively now. And I think um, that would be, you know, this approach is flexible enough to handle that and how you build in constraints for choke species. And we've even thought about protected species. Is, is that on the table here? Could be, could not be, we don't know. But we're just starting to explore that. If you have ideas, we know how to get a hold of you and vice versa. So please send us more. Thanks. Thanks for that, Yvonne. Thanks, Kayla. Fantastic. Um, so this person is asking about the method and could this lead us to basket quotas or something else, else like that? Steve, go ahead. Yeah, I think certainly it could. I think um, what portfolios are, are capturing would be very consistent with either what Jason showed for the North Pacific, where there's an aggregate. Um, it also would be consistent to what the New England Ecosystem-Based Fishery Management um, plan team has been considering with uh, multi-species floors and ceilings. Um, those can be completely consistent with the portfolio that we evaluate in these risk frontiers. So I, I would, my uh, response is that they're completely compatible. Would you agree, Jason? I think so, yeah. Excellent. Um, so we're getting close. We have about three minutes left, but we do have some comments and questions that I want to try to get to before the webinar ends. Um, so this person asks, it might be easier to construct fishing portfolio when all species under consideration operate in open access fishery. However, wouldn't it be daunting to construct when many of regional fisheries operate under some kind of limited access regime? Not to be short-sighted, but most fisheries management is daunting if we're honest about it, right? And I don't mean, again, be, be snarky or, or downplay the comment. I, I think what we're exploring is what are some options to help us tackle and address that issue? And if there's the issues that you know you just raised, Certainly, we could build those in as constraints, you know, open access, limited access. And again, if you use the, the portfolio analogy in the stock market, what, what are some of the constraints for accessing those? What does that look like? What are some fee structures, what, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's a whole level of exploration that we could do. We haven't fully thought through some of those elements. And it gets to the media question earlier. And I think what we would, would try to do is just explore that if it, in fact, probably, I, I think, would be viewed as a constraint more than a configuration. But Steve, let, let me ask you to you know, augment if I'm missing. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be um, a, a constraint that we need to confront, is that the access to different resources, this, I agree with you, would be best implemented in an open access um, but the reality is many of the fishermen 
that are catching ground fish, monkfish, spiny dogfish have multiple permits or endorsements for all of those, either in New England or the South Atlantic. And it, it's almost kind of silly that those have completely different management plans uh, for the same fishing operation. So I agree with you that there are some constraints that need to be confronted, but I also think they're confrontable. Um, and that's where the, the degree of aggregation may help, is that there may be some natural aggregations that have less constraints from the governance and access and others that might be a third rail um, where you know, some user groups may not want to go full um, you know, portfolio with these. I think it's a great point that we're going to have to keep our eye on. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so there was one question that we didn't get to, but um, please email us with your questions. I know we're right at the top of the hour, so I don't want to take up anyone's time. I know we all are very busy and have lots of other meetings that we have to run to. Um, there were a couple of attendees that pointed out some uh, efforts for you, Steve and Jason, to look at that might help guide some of your research. Um, so we'll be sure to send those to you once the webinar is over. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time, you know, an hour to spend with us today, and then all of the time to create this presentation to share with everyone. Um, we're really excited about this project. Uh, I think, you know, this was a great intro to everything that you'll be doing. And for everyone who joined us, thank you so much for joining. Um, please do reach out to us with your questions or any comments that you might have that we didn't get to on the webinar today. Um, but we really appreciate everyone being here. So thanks for your time. Have a great day, everyone.